Welcome to a new episode of Glassroots' Workerspace Lecture Series. Glassroots is a nonprofit glass art studio in Newark, New Jersey, that works to ignite and build the cultural and economic vitality of our community through the glass arts, with a focus on youth and young adults. The Workerspace Lecture Series is dedicated to strengthening craft entrepreneurs and small business owners with inspirational stories and practical advice. Thanks to the New Jersey Office of Faith-Based Initiatives and their ongoing support of our work, we're able to provide this program free of charge to our students. Um, I'm Ellen Lumpkin Brown uh, with Glassroots, and I want to welcome you to the Glassroots Workerspace Lecture Series. It's one of our key programs um, in our virtual studios, and I work in the... um, classroom where I actually teach entrepreneurial skills to teens and adults, along with the glass artists who are teaching uh, glass in the studio. We're so excited to resume some of our in-person programming at our studios in Newark, including some of our public classes, private lessons, and studio rentals for glass artists. And we follow all of the local and federal uh, and state public health guidelines in doing that. Um, We continue to acknowledge what's going on in our communities and in our country, and we recommit ourselves to making our art for our community and with our community in support of social justice, to hold programs that create economic opportunity and tell our students that they can be agents of change, to open their eyes to opportunities and to encourage them to rise up and fully embrace their potential. And today, I'm excited to introduce you to Valeria Hedo. Did I pronounce that right? Yes. Okay, good. Um, Who is a fascinating glass artist who's going to uh, tell us about some new uh, types of glass art for glass roots. Um, And also, it turns out that she's a member of the glass roots family. So, um, Valeria, do you want to just introduce yourself a little bit and your art and Valeria Divinorum? Did I say that right? Yes, perfectly. You got it. Um, Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, So, my actual name is Valeria Haydo. I'm from Buenos Aires, Argentina. I was born in New Jersey, but I left when I was young and I lived all my life there until five years ago that I came back to the US, to New Jersey. I took some courses at uh, Glassroots. I learned how to glass blow there. I made a little pumpkin and uh, I really enjoy the community. And um, I I started um, doing glass work when I was younger um, in Argentina. My mom is actually a glass artist. She does grisaille. She's very good at grisaille. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, In Spanish, we say grisasha, uh, which is a a medieval technique where you paint on top of the glass and then you use a a kiln to uh, melt the the paint into the glass. So it's more with heat, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. But she also does a Tiffany technique. So she invited me to the school, uh, which is called Tasher Escuela del Sur, and uh, which it means um, studio school from the south. Right. And um, my my mentor uh, Andres Jacob, he um, is um, he he teach me how to learn how to solder in the Tiffany technique uh, with mm-hmm. metals and and glass. But he also introduced me to the concept of sacred geometry. Mm. So um, that happened right after I finished my school. Sorry, I didn't mention that. I my background is in architecture, uh, but I'm not. I don't work as an architect, even though I am. Uh, okay. Yeah, I I decided to go closer to my artistic skills. So I, I start developing these, these new skills and I see art in a way that I can create architecture. That's why I got into glass also. Uh, I was driven into glass a lot because of its properties of uh, with light reflection. Um, mm-hmm. And um, it's, it's a material like water that you can see through, but it also can reflect light. 
Mm. So I like to see the glass as a, a medium that allows me to experiment with intangible properties of light and create spectral colors and space and create uh, spaces with light, basically. Wow, that sounds fascinating. And I'm just thinking of um, some of the work that I've uh, seen on your website and then also the light behind you. Um, how, how do you use light, should I say through glass? I'm not really even sure, but to create, um, create space. And then I'm gonna ask you something else about the sacred geometry and succulents that has been on my mind, so. Yeah, um, I have some images. Should I share my screen so I can- Yeah, awesome. Share a little bit of a visual, cause sometimes these concepts can tend to be a little bit more uh, complex. All right, so I started with this image, which is a dichroic glass that uh, is one of the materials that I mostly enjoy using because of its properties with light. Uh, this is a dichroic glass that is uh, on a clear glass. It's, uh, it's this texture, the dichroic texture on top of the clear glass. I usually buy these glasses online and I work with them. Mm. And these are the type of glass that I really enjoy using and also allowed me to explore the glass into other ways of using it, uh, such as video art too. Mm. Well, let's say a little bit about the properties of this glass that make it so exciting for you. So all the rainbows, uh, all the different colors, depending on the angle of the light, it creates different colors. Mm. Sometimes you move this glass near the light and it could create a yellow or it could project a purple. So it depends on the angle of the source of the light, it could be the sunlight too. It mm. creates uh, different colors around. Ah, I see, okay, awesome. Um, so I also added a picture of one of my pieces with a light going through it and we can see where the, the glass is close to the surface where it's being projected. We can see the textures of the glass but then mostly we see all the colors and the different ways of light going through the piece. Mm -hmm. When I was talking about how I can explore the colors and the reflections of the light through glass. Okay. And oh, I've seen this back, one, it's amazing. Thank you. And going back to sacred geometry and how I got into glass, uh, this is the first piece I ever made in glass. Oh, you're kidding. <laughs> wow. I love it. Thank you. So this is a, a sphere that has a, a, like a, a double spiral going around it. Mm -hmm. It creates, a, if you hang this piece and you make it spin on its own axis, it creates um, an optic illusion that it feels like this uh, spiral is moving around the sphere. Mm. So those mechanics of starting to understand uh, creation of objects made out of glass and metals that would allow me to explore the perception of space or even objects. Mm. And, and does this involve then um, a geometric relationship between the spiral and the, and the sphere or between the triangles and the spiral? Uh, so the relationship with the piece uh, itself, um, I build the sphere in brass and I solder it uh, with the same solder we use for stained glass. And then I created these little uh, intersections where wherever there's a horizontal and a vertical line intersecting, I created a point to connect and create that triangle in the middle. So if oh. we Okay. The, the spiral almost is built because of the sphere's structure. Mm -hmm. um, and now another thing that I really uh, enjoy about learning uh, sacred geometry through glass was I was able to understand the connection that a uh, human body has with nature. Mm. 
So that's when I got into uh, Sikulins too, that you were uh, asking about. Um, yes, well, tell us about that, that's exciting. I, in Argentina, the, the, um, the climate is very different from, uh, especially in Buenos Aires, from New York. So it's very easy to grow plants because it's very humid and sunny most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, so I started uh, growing my own succulents and looking at them and realizing how they grow their own babies and, and different ways and, and mm -hmm. how all these different ways of growth of life was um, being combined by a, a same mathematical proportion that is called the golden ratio. Okay, yes. That I, I, well, one thing, I'm from California, Southern California, so it's probably a similar climate and succulents are everywhere. They, you don't have to do anything to grow them, they just grow. And they do have such a, particular kind of, it's not symmetry, it's, a, but a, a growth pattern. Is it, is it phi? Is that the? Yeah, the phi number. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yes, tell us more. So um, growing plants and being able to um, connect with nature in this way, uh, it really helped me to uh, feel part of something bigger. Uh, I'm not I'm not a religious person, so uh, when I start realizing how um, these, these patterns of growth of life that was seen in something so common as a succulent, as a plant that's part of your routine, you, you have the plant and you always see it, mm -hmm. and I start realizing how we could find those patterns in other plants and other flowers, such as uh, sunflowers, for example, they have... Mm -hmm. The double, um, the double spiral that we're talking about um, in, in the center of the flower. So when I start studying this, um, I really like the, the scientific part of it where I could explain uh, something that it's hard to explain, but it's, um, it's hard to understand sometimes, but it's visible to ourselves in a very uh, easy way. Mm. right it's, it's it's something that could be obvious but it's not we don't talk about it too much maybe uh i i wasn't i wasn't aware about these patterns in nature as much as when i start studying them okay great um so then i started working with different other uh, geometric objects this is uh, a shape that is called the icosahedron and it's a platonic solid, and it represents the composition of the mo molecules of the water. Mm. Then I started working with more complex shapes. I liked uh, sacred geometry a lot, but I felt like I was uh, just repeating things that already exist, even though uh, we think about water and we don't think about the icosahedron, but it does represent the composition, the, the growth of it or the, the chemical composition of the water. So then mm. I start playing with other patterns. And this one, in this case, I start working with the honeycomb. Uh, so it's kind of hidden, but you can see some of the hexagons. Oh, yeah. Yeah, now I see it. Um, and for this piece, I, I, I brought it over. It's not a piece that I shown that much. It's a piece that I really worked in and it, um, it was through a difficult part of my life where my dad was very sick. And um, I brought this because I feel like um, stained glass and especially Tiffany technique has been giving me um, almost like a therapeutic therapeutic support where uh, because of the, the amount of detail and process of this technique that it takes a lot of um, um, focus and detail and you also have to be delicate but at the same time strong with it mm. uh, like cutting glass it's something that you have to feel the courage to do it because you only have one chance to do it and if not mm. you can break it all <laughs> right right and so sometimes also, it's going sorry. to happen yeah it happens even right. though you've been working with the glass for many years and and I like that because it also helps me to understand um, 
the idea of the connection with nature, uh, also through a material that could be seen as like a strong material because it's we use it for architecture, we use it for windows, right? Right, but at right. The same time, it's so fragile. Mm -hmm. So I like that also that aspect of the glass and and how. Um, it could become something almost spiritual to create stained glass. Hmm, it's wonderful. Um, did you know, by the way, that uh, in that Tiffany has one of its original facilities in in Newark? No. Yeah, it's closed now. But uh, years ago, in the North Ward, is the Tiffany factory where a lot of those techniques were, um, you know, were used to to manufacture that. Uh, incredible glass. Um, well, this is this is wonderful. Just what's this one? Sorry, I was um, I, I have so many pictures. I was thinking also just to scroll them while we talk to but sorry if you wanted to say something about this. Um, no, no, I just really uh, the as with most art, the more you look at it, the more things that you'll see. Um, and it just kind of draws you, draws you in. Um, Thank you. Oh, and this one, I have uh, this white triangle on the bottom that has a flower and this other brown one up here that has uh, some drawings. My mom painted those. So I sometimes oh. some pieces that my mom makes. Okay, great. So she's still doing that then? Yes, yes, we got, uh, she moved to the US uh, a few years ago too, and um, we got her a, a kiln and she's working on her gaze eye work. Awesome. So I was curious about where you create. Um, are you working in the space that we're seeing now or do you have a different space where you go? Yes, uh, no, I'm at my home. Uh, this is my living room. And I have a space, um, thankfully I have a big living room. It's not coming in New York, um, but um, I have my big table in the living room. My partner allows me to keep all this space here and I have all the glass in the living room and it's my studio here. Awesome, it's great. <laughs> um, and you, um, you make art for installations and, um, well, oh wow, look at that. I, I was gonna ask you about the art that you, uh, art pieces that you sell as well, but please tell us about this one. This is called the 64 Tetrahedron Star. Um, it's basically the geometry that um, expresses all the geometry that appears in nature. Uh, so inside of this shape, all of those shapes fit, um, if that helps to understand a little bit. But basically, um, I made this, uh, I cut these glasses uh, over the last year and a half, and it, I, I just cut all the glasses, and I had a little, little studio talking about studios. I used to live in a studio apartment where I had my mattress and then a table to work. And <laughs> mo most of my work all the time, I would do it on a, a hallway that I had that was, it was uh, wide enough to have me standing and holding my back to the wall and giving me space to solder on a little table. Wow. <laughs> That's, wow. a, that's pretty narrow. Yeah, it was very narrow. And for this piece, I didn't have enough space. So I decided to just cut, grind, and wrap all the pieces of glass. And then when I finally moved to another space uh, and I had this bigger living room, I the quarantine started. So oh. I was able, I had enough time to solder this piece, which I don't know if I would have been able to finish if our life uh, schedule would have been the same since the last year. Mm -hmm. Wow. And, and this it, is another angle on it? Yeah, so uh, what's interesting about these geometric shapes is that you can see so many other shapes mm -hmm. uh, side of it too. Yeah. Um, and, they, and they really work with the optical perception of, of the objects and kind of plays with that. Um, 
And then is that a reflection of it behind it? Yeah, this is a reflection. I try to blur it a little bit so it wasn't too strong, but basically it's just LED lights uh, illuminating the piece. And because I use bevel glass, uh, it creates this um, very um, clear drawing of the shape of the glass projected through onto the wall. Well, wow, it's uh, that that is amazing. That is really awesome. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. So I I start working with bevel glass a lot. Um, and this piece, for example, uh, it has a mirror base, a color tinted mirror that it's golden, mm -hmm. and there's all bevel glass wrapped uh, on top of it, creating the cubes bases. Mm. And this is just the sunlight coming into the room and I'm holding the piece with my hand and wow, the sunlight just creates this, this effect in the room. <laughs> it's, it's like it is bursting it, to, for me. It's like it's just bursting into pieces. Yeah. And um, that's, that's, that's another way also to, to see geometry, right? Like it could be a solid object, like the ones I started doing at the beginning. And it could also be something like this, where it's a cube and it starts creating more of what I call virtual geometry, where mm. it's not really uh, what you see as the object, but it's projecting something else. Mm -hmm. And the next, uh, oh, this is a, a picture I took of myself of, uh, uh, it's a selfie looking through a glass that I cut a triangle and then all these um, effects with uh, the computer softwares that I use to to project uh, uh, like more new media art. That's how they call it. It's, uh, it's more uh, I, I work with the light differently because it's processed by the computer, but mm -hmm. always the light through the glass. So what I film when I do my videos, I film the light reflections and I film I use the glass as a lens to see everything. Ah. And so on this glass, is there actually a, an image on it or is that part of the computer? This is part of the computer, yeah. That's wow. just a filter uh, that it's on top of it, but it's just a clear glass uh, that it's just uh, wrapped and soldered. Mm. Wow, so creative. Thank you. Uh, so I put this image in the middle because the piece before this is how it's seen with the sunlight and the next one is through projections. Okay. Ah. So if you see the image being projected, you can see the little circles. That's how usually we see light when we zoom in with the lens very close to the light source. Mm -hmm. um, so this is uh, the glass that I use for this piece. I record um, the, I filmed that glass through light and I went all around the glass and move it around and created this more like a dynamic video, mm -hmm. these light effects. And then I project with a video projector on top of the piece. And that's where it appears what I was calling virtual geometry. Um, some some places I, I've been trying to do more research on on these kind of effects because there's a lot of physics that involved in these kind of things and uh, I'm really interested in 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 seeing how geometry can be unfolded and refolded and mm. one of the things that my professor Andres uh, from Argentina told me is um, he talked about the fourth dimension, that it's not just a third dimension, that we as humans, we always perceive three dimensions, uh, but usually there, um, it, it exists more than one dimension, more than the third dimension. So when you, uh, for example, to understand this is when you have a cube and you create a cube, right. uh, you have six different faces of squares. Right. Um, it. When we have something that it's called the tesseract or the hypercube, which is this shape, uh, it's basically almost like understanding a cube inside of another cube. Hmm. 
Okay. So to create um, the same way we go back from the 3D to the, to the 2D, 2D with the cubes and the squares, the same way we can do that with shapes from the fourth dimension and bring them to the third dimension. Hmm. So that's yeah. what I try to do. I try to like with light and optics, create geometries that are part of the world, but we don't perceive them easily. Hmm. Right, and, and then you're able to illustrate them or project them out exactly of the three-dimensional space with the with the light yes it, it's a little bit complex and for me it's already pretty complex i i'm trying to find better ways of explaining this uh but it, i'm in the process of investigation so i don't i don't really um know how to use the best terms to explain it, but it, it's basically bringing shapes from another uh dimension that it's for example, this is the same concept. It's called a hypercube. Mm -hmm. so I felt in, in experimenting with the, the bevel glass and, and the light effects that it creates, um, I realized that using mirrors to reflect the light through it and then get into the glass through the mirror, mm -hmm. then, it would, then it would be another way to re-evolving or re reanalyzing this um these these complexities and geometry and um so I, I applied a mirror on this shape uh i have another picture uh this is basically the hypercube of, or the tesseract um it's almost the same concept uh which i was saying it's a cube inside of a cube mm -hmm. uh, this is basically a fractal of squares so a fractal is a pattern that repeats constantly and the way it grows, it's the same pattern, but with different proportions. Okay. Um, so if we look at this example, I feel like maybe it's easier to understand what I was talking about the dimensions. Uh, in this piece, I have a projector hanging from the opposite wall where the piece is on. And um, I place it on a pedestal and I projected uh, a video I made of the glass that I use in the sculpture. Uh -huh. And then I was able to find this magical experiment where I wasn't, when you project, if we remember the picture that I showed at the beginning, it was just one flat thing on top of a wall. Mm -hmm. And the projection, right, the shadow of it, the same way we can see it on the bottom right side, this is mm -hmm. the shadow of the piece. So we can see the entire piece. What happens when we project through an angle where the light is pointing directly to a mirror and then it's reflecting through glass, bevel glass especially, this is what happens on the right mm. uh, top. We have these kind of, and it's not only one, there's another one here and there's another pink one on the other side. Oh my gosh. So that's where I finally got to understand a little bit more of the fourth dimension and how we can unfold shapes that we don't see, but they're there. Wow. You know, it, it's, it's fascinating to think about. Um, so you're in a, when you, when you do this, this is reflecting off of each wall. I mean, how, how here's, I guess, the question. How does the light source come into that um, structure, into that piece of art, and then reflect behind it? It's very, um, it's, it's almost like a magical effect because I wish I knew more of the physics of light. I feel like I need to study more of that. <laughs> but when I read about it, it's, there are so many complex words that it's hard to understand. But basically what's happening, and this is what I know because it's what I did, is that the light coming from an angle, mm -hmm. almost like a 45 degree angle directly into the, sh the shape that is pointing into the shape mm -hmm. and touching the mirror mm -hmm. then the way that light is projected 
because it's surrounded by a structured or bevel glass, it kind of creates these effects. But then if we look into the detail of the top right um, on the green, uh, there's some squares that I don't even know where they're coming from. <laughs> <laughs> the angles are so weird because over here we understand that it, there, there's a clear cube projected on the bottom, but on mm -hmm. the top, I don't know how to explain that. I'm sorry. <laughs> wow. It, oh. And and so, well, I mean, that makes me want to ask whether there are installations that you're doing where we can also, you know, see um, this work or uh, if you have things uh, coming up. But I also want to make sure that I ask you about the things that you um, sell because you have some very accessible pieces for, um, you know, for people who fall in love with, um, with what you do. Oh, yes, I do. Um, so currently right now, I'm just going to move a little bit further with this images. There are just some details of the same thing. Right. Uh, currently right now I have this show. And this is in Union Square in the city. Okay. Uh, it's literally half block away from Union Square. Uh, I can share more details later, but it's it's that Chashama space uh, in Union Square. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, people can just contact me and I'll send more details if not, but anyone can visit this is for free, of course. And the gallery is open on through Wednesdays until Sundays, from Wednesdays to Sundays, mm -hmm. from four to eight. Okay. Um, the galleries during the weekends are open from two to eight. So anytime could still work, but I recommend everyone visiting if possible after the sunsets, because then the projections look much more stronger and then you can see much more of these effects, um, okay. but you can still visit the gallery and you'll you'll enjoy the work, of course. Um, this is another piece. Uh, this is another time I was doing visuals with glass um, in a church that there was a concert. Mm. And these are the pieces that I sell. Um, uh, I brought this one is not on sale. I already sold it, but I brought this image because I also wanted to talk about um, how it's important to be committed with as an artist and be active in uh, any anything that you could be doing to help uh, people and and to create consciousness. Because uh, mm -hmm. I was trying to to exp show my work and my sculptures and my installation work more of awareness of yeah we are part of something else we're part of this like nature and this mass structure that it's amazing and we don't even know about mm. but also um i'm from argentina and over the last uh i think it, it's been like more than eight years more actually because it's the movement started a while ago but there's a huge movement of uh feminism that uh we've been fighting for legal abortion in argentina and um, this has been something very important for me growing up in, in a place like Buenos Aires um, where there's a lot of, uh, um, how you say, like um, unequalness between women mm. and men. Yes. And um, so I fight that with my heart because it was one of my struggles growing up over there. Mm. And, and and I want to create that awareness. Uh, so I started making stained glass pieces that had different more of, of course, this is a uterus and mm -hmm. uh, other symbology. I, I'm one of my references in art um, for these kind of works is Georgia O'Keeffe. Oh, wonderful. And I, I really like the way she works with flowers and, and, and feminist, feminine uh, shapes and more mm -hmm. messy uh, colors and shapes. Mm -hmm. So these are things that I sell. These are a little bit more expensive uh, because of the amount of time and work put into these. Mm -hmm. But I also have smaller objects that are sun catchers. Um, I like to call them um, space healers because they create rainbows and a lot of light colors around. So it, Almost, 
I feel like anyone can have this at home and contemplate it and feel a little bit uh, more calm or at least that's the feeling that I get when I see these kind of colors and light reflections in my rooms. And, and we all can use that uh, now. Yes. And you know, it's interesting to hear how you really are blending your, um, your art and those passions that feed that with um, commerce in terms of the things that you sell. Um, I know that some artists feel some tension between um, selling things and, and the artistic process. Do you ever feel any of that? Not personally. I do get those um, comments from people uh, in the art world. And um, I think that Usually, well, this is bevel glass, so I, I have to use new materials for these, but it, it almost like it almost feels like people can have in their homes a piece of my work because it's the same materials and it almost has the same idea. Mm -hmm. But of course, it takes me a lot of time to create a hypercube, so I can't sell those very accessible, but because then um, it's not um, it's not going to. Um, give me anything back if I if it's my work, right? But I try to make art and, and, and smaller objects and jewelry too. I have uh, some jewelry objects that I make. Mm -hmm. uh, and I try to make those with uh, most of, uh, especially the jewelry with scrap pieces of glass that I have from my sculptures. So mm -hmm. I recycle what I have. So then it's not a big cost of materials, it just, I just um, put the price for the amount of time that it took me to do it. Unless mm. I'm purchasing something too expensive like Dichroak glass. Right, or, right. and especially for that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But I, I try to uh, recycle as much as possible. I make uh, bracelets uh, with stones too. Um, I make rings. And uh, some of the stones that I put in my work were donated by an artist that was mm. their studio. So I also don't charge too much for the pieces that I have with stones because I think it's an energy that came to me and it has to go back to the world. <laughs> oh, keep the cycle, keep the cycle going. Yeah, I feel like that's how it works. Um, that's how it worked for me too. Uh, every time I talk about my work is, I always say art comes to me in very, unplanned ways and almost like I just follow some of my instincts and then all of a sudden doors open I'm not mm -hmm. trying to push to be a famous artist or to be the best glass artist in the world uh I don't need that type of recognition uh what makes me happy and that's why I really enjoy and I appreciate you inviting me again to to this um series is because I'm a person that wants to create art for the people and with the people too. Mm. I, I am a professor. I teach at LaGuardia Community College. Mm -hmm. I teach art. And I also been teaching and doing uh, residencies uh, in the Bronx in senior centers and school and public schools. Mm, wonderful. So every time I, I'm, I'm working, I'm trying to create that uh, connectedness with art from not a snob place where everyone is invited and everyone is an artist. And if they don't want to be called artists, they can just be a person that likes to do art and enjoy it. And without any tags or any assumptions of what art making is. I love that. I love that. That is such an empowering way of thinking about um, art and bringing people to something that is probably already inside of them and giving it a way to come out. Especially, yeah, because, well, uh, I don't teach stained glass too much anymore because of COVID, uh, but I used to have a web page on a place called Course Horse, and mm -hmm. they me a bunch of students. And <laughs> 
I would have those students over and uh, every time a student would come over, they would be like, oh, this felt more like a art therapy class, not just a stained glass session. And it is, it's because uh, anyone can have the skills of creating something that they enjoy. Mm -hmm. And it, it's just about letting people um, forget about the fear that we build when we become older because kids don't do that but I just that's right I can't so true. yeah we can't do stained glass with kids I we tried it once at a community uh garden in 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 Brooklyn uh that I was invited to give a free workshop and I was very scared but the parents were there um <laughs> but I don't think it's a good idea so getting people to have the skills of Tiffany technique uh, and, and teaching them the skills, but also letting them produce their own designs. That's something I always encourage in my classes. I don't bring students and tell them what to do unless they really are lost and they don't know and they really want me to guide them. Mm -hmm. I give them at least um, um, at the beginning of the class, uh, a, a section of it to design what they want to do and to look around the glass. Cause sometimes I have many different pieces of glass and they can come and look at them and choose by the glass or choose by the shapes they want to do. Yeah. And that yeah. Free them and that comfort uh, that someone else is next to you and is going to guide you, but it's not going to tell you what to do. I feel is a key for any artist instructor. Mm -hmm. I totally uh, get that. And I think the artist instructors at Glassroots take the same kind of approach um, when you're introducing such a new, you know, material for most people, but realizing that they've got so much creativity inside that they can, you know, pour into that. Um, just with a little bit of guidance about how to not hurt yourself, you know, sort of. And, uh, and and otherwise let things flow. Yeah, definitely. Um, and the last picture I put on the presentation is this one uh, that speaking of making art for the community, this is this is a Manhattan Bridge. A friend of mine uh, that does light art uh, invited me uh, to project uh, my videos of glass onto the bridge on uh, Dumbo on Brooklyn side. Mm. And this was an event that was there in the streets. It's street art, but it's pretty unconventional because I never, I never worked with a projector that big. It was, <laughs> it was something amazing. Um, so, so this in right underneath. Um, on the left. Yeah, that's that's your piece. Yeah. That's your, yeah. Wow. And that was an event that I really liked because it was on the streets. Anyone could just be walking by, look at some art, keep on walking or sit down, have a coffee, watch them. It was a bunch right. of them too. That sounds awesome. How big was the projector? I don't remember. This was, I think in 2017 or 18. Uh, I, sh I shouldn't, should remember, but I, I forgot. I, I so. bet it was huge. <laughs> it was huge. It was huge. Yeah. 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 Um, well, let me, um, I don't want to take too much of your time. You've been so generous and, and um, shown us so much and really took us on a journey there. Um, but I always like to ask people, and this is sometimes helpful to um, our younger um, students who, who watch our video series, because we work with, well, we work with people to age 10 and up, but certainly in the um, in many of our programs, like high school students. And I like to ask people if they could give some advice to their younger self, you know, pick an age, whatever feels good to you. But what, what do you think you would tell yourself? Um, I would tell myself uh, from high school, maybe when I was 18, I had no clue what to do. I finished school. I actually came to New Jersey for almost a year to work at a mall to see how life was here. And, um, and I went back to Argentina and I decided to study architecture mm -hmm. and it was too expensive to come here. Over there, it's for free school. So oh. it was different options too, right? But 
I studied architecture without enjoying it. And I spent uh, more than almost seven years of my life uh, dedicating most of my time to a career that uh, definitely gave me a lot of tools and I don't regret at all. Mm -hmm. but maybe I would have told myself to worry less about the expectations of society and how good I have to be to be an independent woman in this world. And uh, that the most important thing, even though it sounds very cliche, uh, is to follow your heart, follow your mm -hmm. instinct, follow your gut and, and choose what makes you happy because that's where you're gonna shine. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the only place where you're gonna shine. Yeah. <laughs> light. And let out the light. Yeah, I think, I think that's great. And it is something that is really um, not only important, but hard for, you know, sometimes people to understand when they're thinking about what I'm going to have bills and I'm going to have, you know, all of these things that I need to do. But when you shine, some of those other things come to you also. You exactly. And, and it is something magical that it takes time to understand and accept. But at the same time, we have to keep ourselves being creative. We have to be responsible, but we also have to be very creative. And mm. creative, it's not just being an artist and being uh, creating colors around the world. It's more about, I have these things in my hand. This is, these are my options. This is the path I can choose. Right. Uh, which is the best path and how I can make it fun. Mm how I can make it a fun pass, how I can make it different and unique because it's everyone has their own unique path and, and lives and, and skills and gifts. So yeah. it, it's a journey to discover, but it's definitely worth it. Yeah, worth it. And thinking about it that way, my mom always says, there's only one of you. You're the only one. So uh, use what you have and observe what you have and um, well, anyway, uh, Valeria, I wanna thank you so much. This has really been uh, great. It, it would almost feel like I went on vacation a little bit. <laughs> yeah, because it opened up such a different way of, of thinking. It's great. Thank um, you so much. Is there anything else that you wanna um, highlight before we, before we wrap up? If anyone, um, oh, I know we're going to be posting this a little bit later. So the show that I was talking about is going to be up until uh, March 20th. Okay. And I'll be in the gallery that day. So if anyone wants to come and meet me in person, oh, bring good. your mask. But it's a Saturday and I'll be there all day from 2 to 8. And it's in Union Square. And uh, maybe if anyone wants to follow me on Instagram, uh, I'm Valeria Divinarum. Maybe we... We're going to write that down. <laughs> yes, we will put that up so that uh, people can follow you. We'll put a scroll up for that. Oh, thank you. And yeah, sure. I have another Instagram for my craft and my jewelry. I'm trying to keep it separate uh, so I can display both things in different ways. Um, okay. Not only one, but uh, anyway, they contact me. I can send information. I'm open to do custom pieces if there's a shape they like and they want a specific color, things like that. Oh, great, great. Okay, well, afterward, you'll send me the right information and we'll put it up um, at, the, at the close. But again, thank you so much. And I just need to read one little thing as we um, finish, uh, finish up that um, we're encouraging everyone to visit Valeria's website and to visit uh, our website, you'll have a chance to learn a lot more about Glassroots or to shop in our online gift store uh, where we have beautiful products made by our artist instructors and our alumni and our students. And you can stay tuned to our Facebook page, our Instagram for the next episode of the Worker Space Lecture Series. I'm going to try and make sure that this one does come on in um, March, Valeria, so that people can get out to meet you. I think that'd be the coolest thing I'm going to try oh, after sunset. <laughs> and I also want to um, 
give a big shout out and thanks to the Office of Faith-Based Faith Initiatives in New Jersey, who is supporting this lecture series and we wouldn't be able to do it without their help. So um, we are very appreciative of that. Thank uh, you so much, Alan. Uh, and Valeria, everyone. thanks. And uh, I, I will see you on the 20th, one way or the other. <laughs> Great. Great. Thank you so okay. much. So Thank nice you. Okay, and take good care. You too. Bye. Bye bye. Thanks so much for joining us today. We encourage you to visit our website to learn more about Glassroots or shop our online gift store for beautiful glass products made by our artists, instructors, and students. Stay tuned to our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for our next episode of the Workerspace Lecture Series.